In early September, an amateur astronomer noticed something unusual in solar observation data, a faint smudge moving through space. That smudge turned out to be a brand new comet heading our way that we're now calling Comet R2 Swan. But Swan isn't arriving alone. Earlier this year, Comet Lemon was discovered, and it appeared as just a faint speck in telescope images. But now, both comets are brightening and they're making their closest approach to Earth this month, with their peaks overlapping. For sky watchers, this could mean binocular views or even naked eye glimpses. And for photographers, this could be an opportunity to capture something entirely new. And the timing really couldn't be better for the peaking of these comets because it coincides with the Orionids meteor shower peaking. And then later in the month, we have a supermoon, which means that the moon is going to appear brighter and larger, and it's going to be paired with Saturn and Neptune. All the while, we have deep space objects that are rising higher and earlier in the night, and solar activity is increasing. So we're going to talk about all of that and more in this month's Space Guide. I'm Sarah Matthews, and as always, grab a snack because we're going to start with the comets this month, starting with Comet R2 Swan because it has a really interesting discovery story. But just imagine it's early on in September and amateur astronomer Vladimir Bazogli is just looking at data from SOHO, which is the solar observatory out in space that studies the sun. And he's looking through data from the instrument called SWAN, which typically is looking at solar wind. And much to his surprise, he finds this little smudge moving through space, which, you know, wasn't sure what it was at the time. The very next day, it was confirmed to be a comet, and that's why we named it R2 Swan, and it was actually making its closest approach to the sun, and then very soon after that, it did have an outburst that did make it appear brighter. Now, current predictions state that it could reach a brightness of a magnitude six, which is right on the edge of being naked eye visible, but of course, we're gonna have to see how that all shakes out. But regardless, Comet R2 Swan does come from what is called the Oort cloud, which is a cloud around the solar system. So it's pretty far out there. So our chances of ever being able to see it again is uh, pretty low in our lifetime, unless of course we figure out cryonics or some other way to extend our lifetimes, which I know we are working on. But the good news is, is you know, much like other things in life, it's a numbers game. So the fact that we do have another comet that's going to be visible or potentially visible in our night sky is pretty awesome. That's going to be Comet Lemon, which was first discovered in January by the Mount Lemon Observatory in Arizona, hence the name. And when it was first discovered, it just showed up as a very tiny speck in telescope images. But since then, it has grown quite a bit and it's gotten a lot brighter as it's gotten closer to the sun. Solar heat has basically began to vaporize its ancient ices, all of which have been frozen since the beginning of the solar system's birth, which was 4.6 billion years ago. And so through this process called sublimation, when things start to get warmed up by the sun, that's what creates the coma and the tail. And as we can see here, Comet Lemon does glow this beautiful emerald green color, and this is actually a result of the diatomic carbon molecules that are basically getting excited and getting all warmed up by the sunlight. So that's why we're seeing it glow this beautiful green color. Current predictions, at least at time of filming this, do suggest that Comet Lemon could reach a magnitude four brightness. The smaller the magnitude number, the better. That means it's going to be brighter. So that's about on par with the dimmest stars in the Big Dipper. So pretty bright, but nevertheless, just like Comet R2 Swan, this is going to be our only chance to ever see it in our lifetime. Lemon is a long period comet, so it takes thousands of years for it to travel inbound and outbound around the solar system. So again, it's basically our only time to ever see it. So how can you see the comets? Well, Comet Lemon is going to be ideal if you are in the Northern Hemisphere. In early October, look before sunrise towards the Northeast with the comet drifting roughly in the region under Ursa Major. And then by mid-October, it does shift into the evening sky, appearing low towards the Northwest after sunset. It will reach its closest approach to Earth on October 20th through the 21st, and it may continue brightening towards early November. Now, Swan is trickier. Look southwest about 45 minutes after sunset. Early on in October, it will be passing through the constellation Libra. And then mid-month, it passes through Ophiuchus, sliding past the Eagle Nebula on the 17th, right before its closest approach to Earth on the 19th. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, your skies are going to be ideal for Comet R2 Swan because it's going to be much higher in the sky than for us in the Northern Hemisphere because it's going to be, again, uh, closer to the horizon. Now, if you do want to observe these comets, then I would recommend using some binoculars or an eyepiece and telescope. They're not going to appear as clear as a photograph, of course, or probably going to appear more like a smudge, depending on how bright they get. 
But if you do want to use a camera to photograph these, I highly recommend it. It's really cool to do so. So if you have a DSLR or mirrorless camera and an interchangeable lens, or even a mobile phone, you might be able to get some pretty decent views. Of course, comets are unpredictable. That's kind of the endearing nature about them. We could see something where Comet R2 Swan does have an outburst again, like we saw earlier. Comet Lemon could just totally be like a dud and not brighten at all, or it could brighten up, or you know, both of them could just break apart like we saw Comet Atlas did in 2020. We don't know, and that's kind of the fun and endearing part about comets is that they are just so unpredictable. So yeah. And if you would like a deeper dive on how to photograph comets, I did put together this guide over on my Patreon that you can check out. If you want the exact location of the comets in the sky based off of your location, I highly recommend checking out something like Stellarium, which is an app either for your phone or for desktop, or something like Sky Safari, or something like this website, which will help you track it as well. Now, in addition to Comet R2 Swan and Comet A6 Lemon, there are two other comets that I want to talk about this month, one of which is going to be visible potentially in your skies. This is Comet K1 Atlas, which is from the Oort cloud. It does pass closest to the sun on October 8th, and then will pass about 60 million kilometers from Earth later on in the month. Its predicted brightness is pretty uncertain, but current estimates put it around a magnitude 10 to 12 now. But if it does survive its closest approach to the sun, it could brighten to a magnitude 6 to 7, making it a good binocular target by late October or November. Now that we do have an interstellar traveler called 3i Atlas, you may have heard of it. This is the third interstellar comet or object that we've ever discovered in our solar system uh, next to Oumuamua and 2i Borisov. It'll reach its closest approach to the sun near the end of October and early December, but it won't be visible, at least to us, unless you have a very large telescope, probably around the beginning of December. So stay tuned for that, because that'll be really cool to try to look through a telescope or photograph. Now, something a little bit more predictable, of course, is the moon. And this month we have the Hunter's Full Moon, which is the first full moon after the equinox. And what's really cool about this full moon is that it is a supermoon. And a supermoon is when the moon appears brighter and larger. And this is because the moon orbits the Earth in an elliptical, so sometimes it's closer to us, sometimes it's further away. And when a full moon coincides with its closest approach to Earth, that's when we get a supermoon. So it will appear slightly brighter and slightly larger. But the full moon isn't going to be rising alone. It will be paired with Saturn and Neptune, which is really cool. And then just days later, Jupiter and the moon are pairing up as well. And by October 18th, Venus and the crescent moon will be in the early dawn skies headed east, which is going to make for a beautiful opportunity to photograph them with the landscape if that's something that you would like to do. And this all is leading up to the new moon at the end of this month, which gives us the darkest skies, which is great for viewing the comets, for example, as well as photographing them, but also because the Orionids meteor shower will be peaking. And this is one of the most reliable meteor showers of the year. They are particles left over from Halley's Comet. And under the moonless skies, you can catch anywhere between 20 to 25 meteors per hour during its peak. We do have a couple other meteor showers this month that will be active, but not nearly as much of a spectacle as the Orionids, but you know, they're worth checking out. But for the best view of the Orionids, I do recommend heading out anywhere after midnight and just kind of sticking around somewhere with not a lot of light pollution. The radiance of this meteor shower is from the constellation Orion. That's where the name comes from, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you need to only stare at the Orion constellation. This simply means that all of the meteors will appear to originate if you were to stack an image. So yeah, basically look anywhere in the night sky, do let your eyes adjust to the dark, try not to use your phone and stare at it the whole entire time. And yeah, it will be a beautiful experience, I'm sure. So photograph it. You don't need a telescope, you can just use basic DSLR or mirrorless camera and a wide angle lens and a tripod. So now let's talk about the sun and aurora activity because the sun has been increasing in activity. We are approaching the peak of the 11 year cycle called solar maximum, which basically means that we're gonna see more sunspots, more solar flares, more prominences, more CMEs or coronal mass ejections which are these vast clouds of charged particles hurled into space. And so when those particles collide with Earth's magnetic field, they funnel toward the poles and energize oxygen and nitrogen high up in the atmosphere. And the result is auroras, which are these beautiful curtains of light in the north called the Aurora Borealis. But if you're in the Southern hemisphere, they are called the Aurora Australis. But strong solar storms can expand these auroral ovals, 
far from the poles, meaning that if you are in mid-latitude regions, places that don't usually see auroras, well, you may be able to catch a display. So if you're hoping to see one, check out the geomagnetic forecasts with these apps and websites that I have here. Do head out to a dark sky and look north or south depending on your hemisphere. Moving right along, by late October, the Milky Way is going to look quite a bit different for both hemispheres. If you are in the Northern Hemisphere, then the Milky Way core is going to be setting quite a bit earlier in the Southwest. So we're going to be saying goodbye to that. But in turn, we do get the beautiful winter side of the Milky Way, which has beautiful clusters and nebulae and all sorts of different things going on. So that's going to be really awesome, especially as it rises in the North Northeast area. So look out for that. Also in the Northern Hemisphere this month, we have some beautiful deep space objects that are rising higher in the sky. M31, better known as Andromeda or the Andromeda Galaxy, which one day we will be united with, uh, which will be pretty cool and really awesome, I'm sure, uh, the experience that is. But this is our closest and largest neighbor in the local group. And it is a beautiful broadband target, so you do want to observe or photograph it under fairly unlight polluted skies. And there are lots of O3 and H2 regions. These are star forming regions. So if you do have narrowband filters, you can see those as well when you photograph them. The Andromeda Galaxy is a very large target. So if you have a wide field refractor or a telephoto lens, then this is going to be a perfect target for you. Speaking of pretty good wide field targets, the M33 galaxy or a triangulum galaxy is another showstopper that's going to be well placed. So that's going to be another broadband target with H2 and O3 regions. So again, broadband and narrowband is going to be great for those two. But if you're more of, you know, a nebula type of person, then I would highly recommend you check out the emission nebula named after the beloved Pac-Man game because it kind of looks like Pac-Man. This is going to be great for using O3, S2, HA filters or hydrogen alpha, oxygen 3, and sulfur 2. Now, moving on to the southern hemisphere, we do have some really cool targets as well. We do have the small Magellanic cloud hangs high in the sky. This is a dwarf companion galaxy to our own, and you can also catch NGC 1097, which is a barred spiral galaxy with vast tidal tails. And those are, again, going to be broadband targets with really nice H2 or O3 regions that you can image with narrowband targets. Now, speaking of nebulae this month, the Pencil Nebula is really well placed. This is in the Vela constellation. It is a supernova remnant, but really anything in the Vela constellation is absolutely amazing. So you can go super wide and just get tons and tons of different objects in your field of view, or you can go narrow and really isolate, you know, one of these targets or maybe a specific part of these targets. But either way, you can use narrow band with these types of targets, which is really cool. Of course, you can also use them uh, broadband as well, but they are great for light polluted areas. And again, the field of view creativity options are vast. So what are you imaging this month? And do you think the comments will get brighter? Let me know down in the comments. And if you'd like to support this channel, please consider becoming a subscriber or joining uh, on my Patreon for exclusive content. But until the next video, I hope you all have clear skies. Thanks guys.